Recently, uh, last year, was approved for renovation of the pool. We got a grant that reimbursed 70% of that, um, reimbursing the town $208,320. So that, and 45,000 was set aside for the previous year because the town maybe very much wanted the pool to open. And stop here. And we're going to have a guest speaker now. What's what's on? So this is Barbara Biltz, and Barbara is the Assistant Director of Leisure Services <laughs> Department and the General Manager of Cherry Hill Golf Course. And she also has a rich history of working with the Pioneer Valley Girl Scout Council, uh, Tapestry Health in Northampton. And she served in the United States Navy. No, in I didn't. <laughs> or, I'm sorry. I worked for the, uh, you for the Navy. Worked for the Navy, <laughs> sorry. In, in Yaka, Yaka, Yakahama, Japan, yep. and, and also in Atsugi, Japan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also worked uh, with the United States Army. Army in Seoul, Korea, and she uh, went to the University of Massachusetts and also got her Master's of Science at Indiana University, and she's here to tell you the update on the pool. Hello everyone, how are you doing today? Good. So as you look over to your this side here, the left, you'll see that the work that has been done right up to this point is the uh, removal of all the the decking that was there and it was in really bad shape those of you who were here uh, last year remember it sort of had all these frost teeth so that's that has disappeared so um, that's where we are right now there we have hired a firm called Reno systems who won the contract uh, for, won the bid for this project and they're out of Indiana and they'll start work um, very shortly. The work is scheduled to be completed, um, I think, at the latest by Memorial Day. So we should be fine as far as opening <coughs> as scheduled on the 23rd. So let me just quickly just go over some of the things that are going to be done, some of the renovations. It's a, it's a major project. There'll be a new filtration system that will be a saltwater filtration system quite different and it's it's going to be a, a, a big cost savings for us in terms of maintenance uh, for the pool because of the cost of chlorine it just keeps going up and up uh, there's a new liner that will be put in uh, it, it's a steel pool but it will have a, a new liner that will be sort of a polyurethane type of uh, application to that a new gutter system new decking of course a new fence uh, we'll have new benches in there water fountains, uh, shade structure, and then inside the bathhouse itself is, we'll have a new ventilation system put in as well as uh, resurfacing, uh, new resurfacing of the floors which were in really rough shape. So thank you town meeting for voting for this appropriation because uh, although uh, we, were, we were very successful in uh, getting a part in the Massachusetts Park Grant um, that to the tune of $208,000 there is a 30% match on that, which the town will uh, pay for, and that, that match is around 89000 So thank you uh, for voting that. Who's that grant from? That grant's from the state of Massachusetts. And when's the grant opening, Barbara? Grant opening is scheduled for the 23rd of June. Thank you for okay. mentioning mention that at 10 o'clock, and we'll have a, a grand opening celebration. So please... Uh, Stay, stay tuned to the, the newspapers and the bulletin or whatever, and uh, we'll any, have any, details about that. Any other summer program from Cherry Hill or anything mm -hmm. that you want to advertise? Um, well, sure, I can tell you that Cherry Hill opened on March 11th this year, which is a record, and we're on pace to exceed our revenues from last year, which is terrific. So we're, we're thrilled about that. We also were successful in getting a grant from uh, the National Golf Association for a program called Sticks for Kids. So any child who wants to come to Cherry Hill and doesn't have equipment, we can provide them equipment to use at no charge. And we'll also be doing several clinics throughout the summer to teach kids how to golf. So it's fun. Okay. All right. Thanks All right. a lot, Barbara. Let's give Barbara a hand. Yes, there are fees associated with the Easter Pool. It averages, a, it's based on residency as well as non-residency. It averages about $5. And then there are memberships that you can buy as well.
for okay. the entire summer report. Nelson had a question and then, uh, oh. My question has to do with, you know, I was a low income kid. I never took swimming classes uh, because I couldn't, uh, my kids now swim better than I do when I was a kid. Is there anything being done for like the low income kids to attract them, maybe to get some free swimming classes there? Absolutely, we do have financial assistance for anybody who uh, qualifies for the reduced uh, lunch or free lunch program at, at the school, through the schools. So yes, there is financial assistance up, up to like a 75%, even 100% in some cases, and that's made possible also through Friends of Amherst Recreation provides some assistance as well. Great, last question. Can you say a little bit about the, you said salt water, what, the filtration? Yeah. I that's did, instead of chlorine? Uh, it's what? instead of it's. I don't really know that much about it, so I'm not the right person to ask. I have swum, have swum in some of these pools, and they're really they're terrific. It's amazing, and uh, I think I think uh, we're going to be real happy with That's the outcome. Boring, then. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. right. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Okay. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thanks, Barbara. Appreciate it. So we're now at Olympia Drive. And I'm sorry the windows are a bit clogged up, but if you can clear, clear, the, clear your window and look out. Um, I'm going to introduce Mary Streeter, who is a member of the Community Preservation Act Committee, and she's going to talk about some funding for a couple of houses here. Okay, um, last year we approved $350,000 in CPA funds um, to rehabilitate 22 units, and there are two duplexes here. So this would be four of those 22 units. Um, there are some others scattered throughout town. Um, and what we did was match that 350,000 with two different um, state funds. So that I think the whole total project is a little over a million. Um, but all of these units that were built about 20 years ago are being rehabbed and try, they're going to try to make it more energy efficient and uh, just sort of spruce them up, put new energy star appliances in. And so what we'll have for the next, I think it's 10 years, is a debt service to help continue paying for this. And what they've done is refinance that debt service. So I think this year we're actually not going to make a payment toward it, but it'll come back again next year until the whole thing is paid for. So with CP we pay for some projects outright in the year that they're um, recommended and other times we will um, be able to do more by taking out loans and so this is one of the loan um, things that is being done. And I uh, forgot to give more of an introduction for Mary Streeter. She's been a retired teacher, taught in the Amherst schools for decades, and has been a town meeting <laughs> member for decades as well. Uh, no. And, no and, and she's a member of the town meeting coordinating committee. Uh, That's and, decades. And volunteers hundreds <laughs> of hours making the town, helping with the town website. You're not helping yourself by adding decades. <laughs> and we're showing the wealth of her experience. Uh, and I'm going to uh, tell you about the next thing that we're just going to drive past since the motor is off now, which is down at the end of this road, when we go off to the right, you're going to see um, a big dug up area, which is going to be a housing development. Uh -huh. And that is going to be affordable housing. That's Olympia Oaks project. Um, and there's $250,000 that has been appropriated towards creating 42 units of affordable rental housing suitable for families with more than 75% of the units containing two or more bedrooms. And all of the units will have residents whose income is below 60% of the area median income. So um, this is a, a big development. Yes, Mary, what else? And I wanted to add a couple of things. That there'll be three units for hearing impaired people, and there'll be three units for wheelchair handicapped accessible. Um, and this is something for those of you who've been in town meeting for decades, that this has come back to town meeting again and again yeah, with different great. land swaps and, and things like that. And um, the HAP um, organization, I forget what HAP stands for, um, is a housing, nonprofit housing organization, and they're um, taking over the uh, building of this. And they came to us before. We've already put in um, 200000 toward this, uh, toward the um, infrastructure of the road work and the bringing in various pipes and things like that. Um, they asked us this year for an additional 250000 A lot of their work is by getting grants from federal agencies and state agencies. And they felt that if we could um, give them a significant additional construction money, that that would help secure grants. Apparently, more and more communities are doing affordable housing, and so it's quite competitive at this point. So they won't hear. I don't. They they applied in February, and I don't think they'll hear till sometime in late May 
whether or not they got that matching grant and, I, and if they don't I think there's one more chance for them to apply again but um, this would help to make this actually get finished okay Ellie, I understand that there will be at least two units for homeless people yes yes that's right um, th th they, there's something in the CPA report um, that talks about that, that okay Larry has a question yeah, uh, I thought it would be on oath to completely about what percentage of housing in Amherst will be affordable. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, it does help that those will be countable affordable units because Rolling Green has, I think, 200 countable units and that's going offline I heard in 2013 unless some kind of deal gets worked through that would allow some of those units to stay countable so we don't know because some houses come on some come off so uh, but it's a real good question that we should keep in mind because uh, the whole reason why countable housing is important is that if we fall below 10 percent affordable units that allows a developer to come in and do what's called an unfriendly 40b which means they could build a development and override the current zoning and there's nothing that we could do about it so it's an incentive um, on state law to encourage people to have affordable units in their community Okay, um, we're going to have two quick questions, then we're going to keep going. Yes, uh, um, okay. John. Um, it says families here. Um, does that mean that unrelated people will not be eligible for it? That's a really good question. I think it will be up to the um, HAP people to enforce that and how they do that. I really couldn't answer that question, but that is a good question to ask them ahead of time. Families. My sense is that it is for families. Okay, um, and Frank. Just the last one, how, how soon do they expect to start construction and when will they be eligible to get people in? Well, construction has it's already started. begun yeah, um, and there was a timetable. It partly depends on grants coming in to you know keep moving it forward. Mm -hmm. So I really can't answer that, um, but that I might be able to um, contact the man. I can't think of his name right now, but I've got it back on my computer um, yeah, to ask you. him these two questions because they're good questions. So um, I'm going to keep us going. Yeah, and one I'm other thing I want to say too. Um, we're not going to stop at the cemetery, but I'm going to pass around some pictures of another CPA um, project, the Emily Dickinson fence. I don't know if that's yep, what you this have. Is it. Yep. Okay, you can pass um, yours and I'll we'll pass these. Pass ours. Um, and, and how much funding is it for um, CPA? Well, apparently in the past we've funded uh, 25000 and so none of that money except for 3000 was spent. The, they hired an um, expert in this sort of repair to do an analysis, and um, the analysis has come in that it, they need more money. So this is a, um, a proposal to, to rezone an area um, from the intersection of Pine Meadow and, and North Pleasant Street up to Coles Road for Village Center zoning. Village Center zoning is uh, intended to be mixed use, residential, commercial, retail, office, um, um, more dense than uh, uh, a strictly residential neighborhood but also including uh, businesses and, and uh, um, quality of life things. So it's, it would be changing uh, zoning. This, this zoning along Montague Road right now is uh, neighborhood residential zoning, it's RN. So the frontage is RN. All that's behind it all the way to 116 is commercial zoning. So all of that, actually the frontage, this, this property back here behind me would be um, changed to the, to the Form-based NABC zoning. What does that mean? It's a NABC is is like our our business village center zoning. It's very similar to that, but it includes form standards. And what's the acronym mean? North Amherst Village Center. Uh, and form standards are are they attempt to regulate not just uh, the use of a property or the dimensions of a property, but what it looks like, how it fits in with the neighborhood, how it fits in with the street. Um, how how the how the neighborhood uh, grows over time. 
What kind of businesses could come into this? Um, offices, retail, um, 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 there would also be um, multi-unit residential possibility. Um, and apartment house? The apartment, not multi unit. Like apartment. village zones? Yeah, it's, it's like our, we currently have um, village zones that are called our residential village center and business village center. They're, they're two slightly different um, scales of, of density for village centers. We have them in several places in town. We actually have it here below the river, um, below the river to Pine Street, Meadow Street. That's our already zoned village center, but that would change to NABC, which is. Um, um, includes the form standards. Okay, um, I think what we're going to do is, before we open up to questions, we're going to have another perspective, um, and then we're going to do questions while we're driving to South Amherst. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to introduce Janet Keller. Um, Janet, could you see her that? There you are. So Janet is a member of the North Amherst Village Improvement Association, and again, we're, we're not advocating, just different perspectives have different facts. Um, <laughs> And uh, she has worked as a planning policy and program director for the state of Rhode Island uh, environmental and energy agencies. She has a master's in public administration. She worked uh, on the statewide mandatory municipal recycling program and coordinated the Rhode Island greenhouse gas project. Uh, and she's a member of the North Amherst Village Improvement Association. Janet. Sure. So uh, I'd like to talk uh, just quickly about the townwide impacts of Articles 24, 25, especially when taken together with a line item that's in the capital budget. So the, uh, it's important to note that either Article 24 or 25 that established the village center zoning for Atkins and North Amherst would s essentially set, pave the way for village center re rezoning throughout Amherst, and that's been the plan all the long way back uh, to the mid-2000s. Uh, the town has uh, been attempting to set up these mixed-use village centers, as Rob discussed. So if uh, either one passes, then an important step has been taken in setting up a template for rezoning the underlying zoning as well as the form-based aspects throughout the town. So that's important to note. Um, one concern is that in an apparent um, paradox, village center zoning is trying to bring in mixed use in order to have greater business vitality and more diverse businesses. But the realities of the housing market here in Amherst are that it's dominated by uh, multi it's dominated by the multifamily market and particularly student housing so there's it raises a concern that the uh, especially with the way village center zoning is set up since it allows mixed use throughout the village but not necessarily in any one building that the mi businesses may not ev ever come through and it may end up to be just multi-family apartments and townhouses. You should be aware that while the zoning subcommittee worked really hard to resolve some of the issues about last fall's rezoning, they've not all been resolved and uh, this uh, there's a lot of concern that this would bring you can see the densities here but if you uh, look around us further and I'll give you some maps uh, showing this Basically, there's a lot of very low density, uh, flood prone farmland around here. And um, not all of those concerns have been resolved. Uh, the zoning subcommittee deserves a lot of credit for trying to tackle those, but it's a complex problem. And here's a couple of maps that relate to those points that Janet had said. Yep, and I've got some as well. So, um, the only final thing I would like to say is we're still missing some critical pieces of information. We had been looking for analyses of how farming, flood capacity, and other resources would be affected. The master plan provides that those things be done before rezoning. We also were looking for build-out analysis. How many uh, units could be, be brought in uh, under this new zoning? And fiscal impact studies. Uh, how would the town fare? Would the tax revenue that comes in outweigh any cost to the town of having this development? 
And finally, case studies of successful village centers in similar towns like ours that are basically a little town with very big uh, student population. And we're, we don't really have that information. So I'll send around a few things for you, um, and you can take a look at those. Okay, so um, Rob, did you want to respond to anything that Janet said, or did you have other things that you wanted to add? Well, I, I, I think she made a good... Uh, I said loud. She made a good... good uh, um, uh, discussion of, of some of the other issues. I, I, I don't disagree with anything that she said. I, I did want to m mention that the what would like oh, this all this all this frontage is would be uh, some of this. Where are we now? The library. Above, above the, the above the river would would not, would be changed. Part of it would be changed from RN to residential village center. Part of it would stay RN, and then all behind the frontage. Would, would change to the form-based NAPZ zone. So that's and, and this and this part right here too. Can change from okay. from commercial and what what is right here is BBC um, and RVC. What does that mean? Business Village Center and Residential Village Center. Okay, let's have more questions. Uh, Jeff and then John. Rob, I read that Coles, fi Coles filed a subdivision plan that freezes zoning for their purposes and their project. What, how does that affect? This? So. Um, so uh, any any uh, plan that that is filed before zoning changes is grandfathered. So, so they would be able to do something uh, under current zoning, which is commercial. Their land is, is all commercial. Uh, we haven't seen the, the proposal, so we don't actually know what they're proposing. Um, my understanding is that if they don't like what comes out of town meeting, they'll go forward with this proposal. But they actually support the rezoning, and they want they want to develop under form-based code rather than uh, what they have, currently have. Okay, John, back to the question. Yes, Rob. Nice, uh, and, nice and loud, John. Yeah. Uh, okay, Rob, uh, do you agree with what Jan, I heard Janet say, yes, that if, in fact, businesses are not attracted to the development, that a developer could put up a large residential structure that might principally house undergraduate students? Is that a real possibility if businesses are not attracted to the North Amherst area? Um, so, so the, the village center would, would allow multi-unit uh, residential structures, apartments and townhouses by special permit. So that's a discretionary permit. It's not necessarily a yes. If, if they satisfy the conditions that the zoning board uh, sets, then they, they would be allowed to build that. However, um, under form-based code, um, we, we're, we're specifically st stating that you can't have entirely residential in this area. You can't have entirely business in this area. It's got to be a mix. So, so um, it is possible, perhaps likely even, that uh, the residential units would be built first, and then there would be spaces that would would have to be filled by other kinds of, of development at some point in the future. In the same structure, or um, in um, part of the same structure, or just in the neighboring areas? Um, so, the re so apartments and townhouses are are single-use residential things. So they so they would be single-use buildings, not necessarily including businesses, um, but, but uh, mixed-use buildings that include both residences and uh, business use are, are allowed in, in the, under the current zoning and under the new zone. So um, hold, this, uh, hold your questions for just a moment as you move to the right. Um, this land right here is the Nickerson property, and um, this is top number four, $25,000 from the Community Preservation Act funds will be uh, is, is recommended to, to acquire conservation restriction, not buying the land outright, but getting a conservation restriction um, for this property that's right adjacent to the North Amherst farm. And I'm going to pass this map around. So just look there, and then we're going to keep headed to South Amherst to take more questions. Restriction of what? Uh, conservation restriction, so that it can't be developed. And we pay twenty-five thousand dollars to the property owner, and they and that means they can, in the future, the property can never be developed more than it is now. Um, so it preserves land um, and conservation land that's adjacent to the North Amherst Farm. Can I speak to that? Do I have another map that I'll, I'll pass up? This is probably similar to yours. Um, this would be twenty-five thousand dollars for almost five acres of land. Um, it's adjacent to the North Amherst Community Farm, and the uh, Ms. Nickerson who owns the adjacent property and uh, is contributing, I believe, 65000 to um, help uh, prevent this piece of land from being developed. 
Um, the conservation restriction, as Carol said, um, we don't own the land, but it does allow conservation purposes. And I believe Ms. Nickerson wants to use the forested area as a, a way of um, harvesting and researching um, herbs and other kinds of um, forest-related plants. Um, this is uh, the only open space proposal that's coming before town meeting this year. Um, Dave Zomek, the conservation director, um, has said that there are several other people who want to do something like that. So we're also asking town meeting to set aside a reserve fund of $200,000 that in, in case a land parcel is ready to be voted in the fall, that then that money could be used toward that. So um, you'll also be asked to fund um, $25,000 for surveys and appraisals. Any of these parcels that get preserved in any way with CPA funds need to have different surveys and appraisals done, and those things cost money. Okay, so sorry to have that interruption, but back to North Denver. So there's more questions for developing the appropriate zoning for those, for those areas also for a long time. And so this is the latest step in, in what we think is appropriate zoning for village centers, which is um, a, a more dense area than downtown, but not, not quite as dense as downtown. Yeah, I, I so, the reason I ask the question is because it sounds what you're saying to me is a decision is basically more, mostly being made from the top and including the people from the bottom, because I think the residents in that area are, are, are probably gonna have certain needs, you know, to develop a sense of community in that area. 
So it, by just simply saying that the town has made that decision and not having a survey of, of people, then it really creates a political clash there. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, that's what I'm saying, because I'm, I'm, I'm new, I admit it. I'm just saying that usually when, we, when I'm as an administrator in higher education, we make decisions, we gather data and ask what the students or the residents or our clients want it. That's all I'm saying. Okay, another question. Um, so uh, back in, Janet was responding to Nelson's point, maybe. I would like to do that. I'm circulating. Thank Someone you. has a blue map uh, and it describes the results of the charrette and uh, about a hundred over a hundred people attended that and there was a great deal of support for that charrette report um, the, the blue map that has the charrette report and stuff on it so it included the things like improving the center core compact development in the core etc but that's described on, on that other map okay um, uh, Mary and <laughs> uh, I want to say there was a survey done a couple of years ago as part of the master plan process. It was called a random survey of something or other. And that is available on the town website. And one of the, um, the there's a quick little fact sheet there that shows the, the top five most wanted things and the top five least wanted things. And one of the least wanted things was more apartment student housing, which so it's interesting that that's was a result of that survey that was across the whole town. So um, there are, um, under the capital planning items, the capital budget um, is over $3 million, a little over $3 million. It's 6.5% of the tax uh, tax levy. And um, so stop number five, this is the area that was um, the, the gateway study area. and. Uh, $40,000 uh, is being requested by the planning department for the gateway slash town center feasibility study. Um, and I have the proposal by um, Jonathan Tucker, so you can read it yourself. Um, but basically the purpose is, quote, to complete visioning and the development of new form-based zoning for the gateway corridor area and the rest <laughs> of the town center as a continuous center. So I'm going to pass around um, the proposal, and this has been recommended by the Joint Capital Study Committee as part of Article 17. Um, another part of Article 17 is North Amherst Studies and Improvements, and that uh, is what uh, Janet had referred to earlier. That includes $30,000 for a design and engineering study um, and $20,000 for site improvements in North Amherst. And here's uh, Jonathan Tucker's proposal that you can take a look at. That's also part of the recommendation for Article 17 um, from the Joint Capital Study Committee. Okay, now we can go. Yes, and uh, he is 
a member of the, the Hazmat um, Three Count Tri County organization, and he's the team leader for this Three County region. He's been a member of this organization for 20 years, um, and he uh, supervises about 100 people uh, who are either full time uh, firefighters or they're on the call force or they're on the student force. And today is his birthday. Oh. <laughs> funded by the Joint Capital Planning Committee. If town meeting votes for them, the first one uh, is for this floor, which I'll tell you about, and that is for, let's see, how much? That is for um, uh, 61,000 to replace the floor, and then later we're gonna see the roof, which will be 123,000 from the Joint Capital Planning Committee. Okay, here's well, the tell thing. Tell us about the floor first. Pretty, pretty much it's probably from uh, half, half, half way back from, from this truck back back here we have a baby 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 down there as you can you can see we've got crack cracks here and all, all that and that's from years and years of well trucks keep adding getting big bigger and have a have a heavier and this place is pretty much they say the same since 1929. so in fact i put it through 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 some files and i found a, a report from 19 51 that said they needed to build a new a, a big, a big, a big, a big. So you'll, you'll see this is just from the weight, uh, weight and salt, uh, craft dirt and all, 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 all that depends tend, tend to wear, wear away. And uh, I can take a few to down, downstairs. And you can see where it's beginning to come, come, uh, come through the floor, beginning to wear, wear away with the uh, support. The key for us is to get, get this done before it gets really bad, and we end, end up with one, one of those down, down, so. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you, um, I've, got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got some experience with that at, in, in my old, old apartment. We closed down the state station just, just because, because of this, but they, they had a full, uh, the bay basin was a full, full width, width, width of, of the base, and we had to, had to pull, pull out, uh, but then we had, we had three, three trucks, the trucks, it was the old state, 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 station two. And we had to, had to pull, pull them, them, them out of there and ended up uh, condemning, condemning the station because, 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 because of that. So, uh, some, some people want, or want to go, go downstairs and show, show you, actually it's right below here, we have, we have a store, store room down there, which you, you can see where it's beginning to wear away at the, uh, the, con the concrete and uh, the, uh, so the, the, the support port down, down there. So who wants to take a walk down there? And, be, and before we leave this room, I'd also point out that um, there are a couple of purchases that are coming through um, the capital budget um, through the ambulance fund. So one of those is for defibrillators, 50,000 for defibrillators, and 205,000 for a new ambulance. And their ambulances stay on the road a very long time. This ten, one that, ten, ten, ten years. Ten years. So the one it's replacing was from 2003, and it has over 174,000 miles on it. So they really uh, run them a long time. 174 when, when I wrote, wrote <laughs> when that. You wrote this. It's yeah. probably close to the <coughs> 220,000 now. Right. So we were, we're on a little, what, what we've done, we've tried trying to play place one of these. Every, 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 every two two years, and you'll you'll see that we're going going go, going back back in to ask for another one because uh, we were we went off 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 here. We should should have picked picked one up two years ago, but they um, uh, the 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 man the manufacturer had stopped building building build, build the type type of, that we we like. Then it turned 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 up that they were going to get back back into the business. So we waited, we waited a year. So we picked one up last, last year, and now we're back, back, back on site, 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 for this, for this year. How many do you have? Five. Okay. Any other questions before we? We're going to go downstairs. It's loop real, around. real small. So it's very it's small. It's small. So we're not going to have more talking there with, with the chief. We're just going to loop around. You're going to see where the water can trickle down and affect the coats and equipment. Yes, question. Yeah, chief. What's what's the feeling of the ceiling? That's uh, because the, the roof, the roof, the roof would need, okay. need to be In fact, we have four sets, seven, 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 seven roofs. There is, we have two out, out back. This used, used to be a, a garage. So it, it's, it's got a flat, flat roof. And that's, uh, that's, that's the roof where the tree was growing out of. <laughs> yeah. 
and my, my office tend, tend, tends to get a little bit wet. So, uh, and then we've got a roof here, up towards the front, and one, one back, but back here. So there's four sets, sets, uh, separate roofs. One's uh, tar and gravel, one, and the rest of the rest are slate, slate roofs. So. What's the status of having a new fire station in South We're working on that. We're because there was some reference to it. Oh, oh yeah, we, we got to get, get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the thing is, we've got to find, 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 find land. We've got to find the land, land first. That's, that's the tough, toughest part. In terms, in terms of trying to, trying to find the finance, financing for a new, a new place and all that, that won't be as problematic. The key is find, find, find finding land. And the other part, part of that is the more expensive the land, the small, small, small the scope of, of the stage, stage, stage. So we've got to find a good, a good, good piece of land and add a good price or free. So. And does it really make sense to keep this one too then? When when we get get, get a, when we get a new, uh, yeah. a new one no no it we shouldn't we shouldn't shouldn't be, be down down yeah. at least not 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 now it served served its purpose years years ago but because down, downtown is so is so busy and so congested yeah, ju well, ju 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 and I this place is just too small mm -hmm. yeah. so we need we need a we need a, a, a build, building that that, that that can facilitate all all our equipment because we have we keep another one of those right right here. <laughs> And we have another fire fire truck that uh, that go goes here, so we're kind of cramped. Very 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 cramped cramped cramped. But we cramped still here. need the, the improvements on this. In the meantime. Well, you know, if we stuck a sh sh shovel in in the, in the ground right right now for for, for a new new station, we we still have to have to have to work and live live live, live here. I mean, we live live here 20, 24 four hours a day, and it's. A bit tread, tread more. And this building so, probably has value. A lot of value. Well, when, you know, when you the move build, out build, land building and and the the yeah. land, the land, the land, the land it sits so, so, it sits on. We're going to have to keep to our time schedule. Any other questions about these particular projects? Yes. Yes. Are you saying there's structural damage to the supports under the floor, or are you beginning, saying that beginning, 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 getting to it? The thing is, we had a have an engineer take take a look at this last fall, I believe. And it, and it need, needs to be done now so that it doesn't, it doesn't get, get, get to the point where, where there is great structural stru stru damage. damage so. May I ask one question? Yes, Chief, before you came, there was a very well-detailed study of a yep. new fire station in town. Oh, yeah. Is that still timely, or would Absolutely. that need to be redone? Absolutely. No, it, it doesn't need, need to be re, re, redone. In fact, that built on the lap, the, the, the two, two pre, previous to it. And it, it's, it, it, it's, it's still, still valid. It still, still makes make sense. Good to we hear. Just, we just have to do the work. Yeah. So Good to hear. Any, any other burning questions? All right, great. So no, what we're going to no do is... No <laughs> So we're going to go downstairs, and because of time, we're just going to filter around, and when we come out, we're going to go straight out this door on the left, and you're going to look up at the roof, and uh, you want to ask the chief a question before we on the bus, you can do that. $20,000 recommended from the Joint Capital Planning Committee for 16 security cameras to be put in the Jones Library. Um, there have been some security issues and staff is concerned about safety and they're going to be placed in areas that won't interfere with uh, confidentiality of people meeting or using the computer, mainly like in more remote areas like in the stacks and in various hallways. Um, anyway, and there's also a policy being developed to go along with confidentiality so that uh, their, the video cameras are properly, uh, yes. So the cameras are going to be, um, the, the price for the cameras went down dramatically because the town helped to, to fund them through the town IT system. So they're going to be connected to the police department, but not monitored by the police department unless the library were to request their assistance for, some re for something. So there would be the, if, if the library said, <coughs> we need to have police monitoring, there's something happening there right now, then they could switch, they could, I don't know whether it would be a switch or how the, the mechanism would work, but, but the, the norm is going to be that they're in the library and they're not going to be monitored 24-7 um, at all. They're going to be mainly for deterrent value. Other libraries that have gotten security cameras, crime has dr dramatically dropped or almost been eliminated just because of the presence of cameras. And if there's an incident, they'll then use the camera to go back and look at the tape. But they're not going to be monitored in any kind of systematic way. Yes, Jim. 
yeah, what, how, I think you, I want to get to the question. What, what types of crime are we talking about and what types of activity are we so, talking about? So there, there have been um, instances of, um, uh, let's see how, how to phrase it, okay. uh, 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 indecent exposure, uh, also some incidents of, of people being in the building after closing without the library being aware of it, staff being aware of it. So staff is sometimes concerned about going in remote areas because uh, they're they're closing up at, alone at night, and um, it's it's they're just they're they're concerned about safety. And there's there have been some recent instances that that um, made it more of an, an urgent thing now. But if the if the cameras aren't being monitored, how? I, so how will that make the person safe for going into the room area? <laughs> well, other libraries that have gotten cameras have said that just the presence of the camera has a real deterrent value, that, that their, their crime rates went to almost nil after they got cameras. Obviously, they're not going to eliminate crime um, completely, um, but... Can with, they go with, back and replay? Yes, yes. Yeah, so if there's an incident, they can go back and get the tape and look at it. So in that way, um, they're both deterrents, but they're also, um, they could have some accountability if there were a problem. Um, there was a question from the young man who's new, and I forget your name. Uh, I'm Dan. Dan, Dan thank you. Well, it was pretty much that. I just, um, was kind of trying to figure out what kind of security concerns would necessitate, you know, the installation of thousands of dollars worth of cameras. Right. So that, that was it. Like, like indecent exposure, um, remaining in the building after hours without staff being aware of it. Um, there may, I think there may have been some instances of theft. Um, so it's, uh, they're, they're needed, staff really felt it was a priority, uh, both for patrons and for their own safety. Um, uh, Mary had a question. Yeah, I, first I was going to ask you about the cameras. You should be some of the more creative um, patrons. Yes, that was that's correct. correct. Yes, yes. yes. So there's, there's a real concern that you need to have full, some kind of staff presence in the basement, and that's been um, lacking. And so she's even been doing some of her office hours with her laptop down in the basement to create more of a presence. Um, and there's a lot of talk about reconfiguring the space, so that would definitely be one of the things that she'd be looking at is having a, a staff presence on a regular basis in the basement. I was wondering about the North Amherst library. I mean, there are places there that seem pretty remote. Yeah, it's just... Uh, it's not something that's that's the priority right now, and I guess there haven't been as many incidences that have come so up. There have been but some? Um, not that I'm aware of, actually. I do want to also mention while we're here, um, t this building that's the mustard colored off to your right um, is the Amherst History Museum, and uh, twenty-five thousand dollars in Community Preservation Act funding is being requested for roof repair. Mary, anything to add to um, that? Yeah, there was a re roof repair on quite a bit a couple of years ago with CPA funds, a smaller portion. Um, and the other thing that they're requesting is 22000 for to create a database of all the historic artifacts that are <coughs> in the museum. And we had to back that around a little bit and make sure that that was legal and it is considered historic preservation, so we can um, fund that at town meeting. Okay, great. So let's go. We're going down the university. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay, another question. Go ahead. We can have more Thank questions. We just have to I'm Phil you. Shaver. I'm a new member of the uh, town meeting. I'm the president of the Historical Society. I wrote the applications. Yeah. Those are two very good uses of your CPA money. <laughs> and Phil, do you want to say anything else about the historic? Uh, no. No? Yeah, so, so you're the, the director or the head of the president? president. President. Okay, great. So and if people wanted to visit, how would they do that? When is it open, Phil? May 3rd, we open up for the summer, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, from noon to 4. Okay, thir Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, noon to 4, they open May 3rd, and it's a very nice building to tour. So welcome aboard, Phil. Yeah, and Dan? Uh, has anybody brought up, like, I guess, alternative deterrence to crime in the library, say, like, using some of the camera funding for after school activities? Or, like, uh, Absolutely. Actually, I. Dan uh, brought up, oh, um, actually we're just going to stop here for a moment and then we'll keep running yep. because, um, so this is a, a, a street acceptance. Rob, do you have any background on this? We did the street there, they moved the sidewalk back a little bit right where they would go in the, uh, in the driveway to big lot. So it's, it's, it's just so the town to take that part of, of the roadway so we can maintain it without having to get easements every time we need to repair it. Okay, now we're going to keep going. Um, it goes all the way to South Amherst, to Eckert. Um Okay, so responding to Dan's question. So, um, 
I was a library trustee, and um, I agree with you completely that you want to, dealing with rowdy teenagers in terms of security cameras and law enforcement is not my first approach. Um, and actually, so one of the things we did was we, um, when this issue came up a, a year and a half or so ago, um, we asked for funding for programming. We appropriated about a thousand dollars to get some programming. Got some a reading club. Got I think some kind of a drama club or something. Um, and we applied for a teen grant through the Mass Board of Library Commissioners for twenty thousand dollars. Unfortunately, we were denied that grant. But I think we'll try to apply for it again. One of the priorities, also, the new director is interested in having a teen room. When we're reconfiguring space, have a designated area where the teens can be loud and maybe they can have music and maybe they can decorate it however they want. Um, because you're right, I mean, people need programs and activities and law enforcement is not the first choice at all. And, and it actually might not have even come up had there not been these other actions like indecent exposure and people remaining in the library after hours without the staff knowing. All right, so now we're going to South Amherst. But I want to make sure everyone has time to ask questions about the rezoning because it's complicated and we have some experts on board. Bob, maybe you can say something about how it's different from last town. The biggest difference is that the boundaries in both places are, are a little bit tighter than they were in the fall. So um, in, in the fall we had on Montague Road, we had um, RBC zoning along both sides of Montague Road north of the river. This time it's only going to be part of that, not all of it. Um, we also had the NABC zone extending all the way to 116. It's not going to extend all the way. It's just going to be on the frontage of Sunderland Road on the west side. Um, and we also changed some of the form standards to further restrict uh, um, the kinds of buildings that can go along the, the frontages of Coles uh, Road and Sunderland Road. In Atkins, uh, the differences are um, we had, in the fall, we had the Atkins Corner uh, uh, Village Center zoning going all the way down the west, the east side of 116 to Country Corners Road. That's actually, that's going to be um, pulled back to just the first property uh, south of the roundabouts. The rest of it would be RVC instead of, of AC Village Center zoning. Um, and that's, that's, um, that's the difference in the Atkins. Okay, um, and uh, this time you did have a question. Oh yeah, that's right, sorry. Sorry, didn't miss your point. <laughs> the other big difference, very big difference, in fact, it's, it's the most significant difference, is that the lot coverage, which governs uh, the density that's possible, is, is scaled way back. Um, it was it was uh, something like 85% lot coverage in the fall. It's gonna be 35% building coverage, 70% 70, 70 lot coverage, which really, um, significantly reduces the, the possible density. So I have a paper that um, was from the planning department at one time. I hope it's still accurate, but it talks about the lot coverage, and I'll pass that around. Uh, and here's another uh, paper that's part of the, an amendment about the alternative compliance that explains that. Uh, the big booklet is all of Article 16, which is dense, but it's important. There were other questions. So the question is, since it's switching from commercial to a different zone, will the industrial uses uh, be eliminated? Is that the right? Would Rob or anyone address that? Yeah. For the most part, the most intense industrial uses would be not allowed in the commercial in, in that area anymore. That's what commercial zone is for. It's for very intense industrial or business use. That would not be allowed anymore. Unless, the, unless it's currently operating. Um, but once the use changes, once once the um, property owner decides they want to change it to something else, then it's no longer grandfathered. It's taken away. So can I follow up for a question? Is the, the typical industrial use, there are occasionally times when a building that is from 1929, for example, needs to be updated or expanded or changed. And uh, often in zoning, if you do major improvements, that, that makes it subject to the new zoning. Okay, so in that case, um, if the use doesn't change, the use would still be allowed to continue. However, the form would, they would have to conform to the form standards, and that would be um, bringing up, uh, addressing the road, um, and uh, entrances, and uh, things like that. So, so it would affect the form, but not the use.
question about this, these two zones, zoning changes in the world. Because we're part of the master plan, I presume. So they were discussed, the idea of village centers. Yeah, so the question is, is the idea of village centers part of the master plan? The answer is yes. Yes, yes. and the second, since we heard a lot of kind of negative questions, I'm really trying to hear yeah. the positives, why the planning board worked so hard on this, what do they see as positive attributes? Okay, um, so, so, so we can talk about some of the positive so, um, I, 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 I don't want to advocate too much, but the, re the, reason, the reason for this is um, the people have expressed that um, being able to walk to, to amenities, to the store, to an office, um, um, energy conservation, um, you know, motivation for improving the roads, all these things are, are reasons to focus development and focus planning efforts on village centers. And so that's, that's why we're doing that. about the 11 acre parcel on the east side of 116 which could end up being quite a bit of multi-unit housing um, so if you could tell the differences and also did the safety of this crossing the road here um, come into play when you were so deciding what's the year you're referring to Mary so everyone else can know what you're talking what's about? the what what you're the safety here. Do you mean this the safety here? of crossing 116? I know that part of the philosophy of a village center is to make it a walkable area, okay. and yet 116 coming down from the notch, the cars go very fast even now while construction's going on. So, and there won't be lights there. That's the whole point of the roundabouts: is not to have lights and have cars stop and have emissions come out of the cars while they're sitting there. So, how on earth does somebody? Across the road from the potential multi-unit housing that will go in on the coal property if the rezoning takes place. Okay, and Rob, with the multi the multi housing, would that be on that side or on or on this side? Um, as far as I know, there's no proposal to put any development up. I mean, we're just changing the zoning. I don't, so I don't know about any potential development. Um, um, a lot of that property that's in RVC, or that would be in RVC back here, is wet and it's not buildable anyway. Um, I agree that there's a safety concern about crossing 116, um, yeah. but basically the, the zoning is is always going to be a compromise, always, and and that's and that's the best that that we could do at this point. <laughs> Just begun. Oh, yeah.